Okay, great. We're going to start this uh, afternoon session of uh, Pangenomics Biohack 2021, which is a fully virtual conference on pangenomics focused on, on active researchers, developers of methods and appliers of methods in, in pangenomics. So it's my, my pleasure to introduce the first talk of the afternoon by Ryan Cheeky. Uh, Ryan is a kind of, uh, of superhero in the space of assembly and bioinformatics research. He has, he's been contributed to many, many uh, significant advances in the space of, of low memory assembly algorithms and also low memory uh, data structures that have been used widely in, in the context of our research. Um, and so today he's gonna be talking about minimizer space to growing graphs for pangenomics. So Ryan, please take it away. Yeah, thanks much, uh, Eric, for the fantastic intro and Gianluca and Enza for the invitation to speak uh, online today. Let's see. Uh, today I will talk about minimizer space, the green graphs. Uh, we will focus on pangenomics, and I understand this is a biohacking conference, so I will also have a focus on technicals. Of course, I don't know how this works here. I think you are all streaming on YouTube. If you have questions, I believe there is. Uh, something like a matrix there's channel. There's a matrix or... channel. Yeah, there's a matrix channel that, that's yeah. listed on the conference. Unfortunately, report. I will not be monitoring it during the talk. So if there are burning questions, please, Eric, feel free to interrupt me during the talk to, to ask one. Okay. Yeah. I will. So before I start, so this is going to be a re some, some recall of what minimizer space the brain graphs are before I dive into the pan genomics part. So if you've seen the talk from from Recom, for instance, so there's going to be some repeats. Um, on my end, I don't really see the top of the screen, but I hope it displays well. Anyway, the title of this slide is representing hundred thousands of bacterial genomes. Um, Ryan, just to be clear, we can see we can see right above the top of the, that line, so I, I think you're you're okay. Oh, great, thanks. Okay, so the, the basic problem that I'm addressing here is how to represent large collections of genomes as graphs. So there has been this year and last year um, releases of large amount of uh, assembled genomes of high quality. So for instance, uh, these collections have been applied to the creation of chemical indices with tools such as Vary, Bifrost, and Blast Frost, which is based on Bifrost, but enables sequence search on those indices. And in a way, this is a way to represent large collections of bacterial genomes and perform sequence search over these collections. Uh, a different but related application is to construct min hash sketches, which are also a way to do sequence comparisons, either sequence search or just uh, computing signatures of, of genomes. But in both cases, in, in the chemical indices and in the min hash sketches, we don't quite get a pan genome graph out of those collections. And so the question is open on how to represent a very large amount of unrelated genomes, so not from the same species, for instance, as pan genome graphs and do operations on them. And so this talk will address this question. There are several challenges Challenges when you actually want to perform such operations, as you might already know, is that even for bacterial collections, they are pretty large. So um, the largest today are terabyte sized. So of course, this gives you a big faster file to process and even constructing a pan genome graph of this collection is a challenge, let alone the visualization of such a graph, which can have up to millions of nodes and edges and most tools today don't support visualization of such large graphs. So in this talk, I will talk about a technique that enables uh, 100x to 1000x cheaper pan genome graph construction through a controlled loss of information. And you probably guessed it, it's based on a recent technique we introduced with uh, Barish Hakim and Bonnie Berger which is called Minimize the Space to Bring Graphs, and it was introduced this year in, in Recomb, and we were happy to make the cover of, of the cell systems issue last October. I will briefly talk about what Minimize the Space to Bring Graphs are. But as a preliminary, I need to introduce what a classical Bring Graph is, and I'm assuming 
pretty much everyone in this audience who's familiar with plant genomics knows what the De Bruyne graph is. So I will refer to the term base space because um, it will be in comparison to minimize the space I will introduce later. And just to be clear, the context here is not so much sequencing data, but instead reference genomes. So if you have a reference genome, it's possible to extract all the k-mers from it and construct the classical De Bruyne graph. However, this is an expensive step if the genome or even the collection of genomes is, is large. Another preliminary notion is the one of minimizers. And in, in our paper, we introduce two concepts in, um, as, a, as an attempt to unify and categorize the different types of minimizers that you can use to construct minimizer space De Bruyne graphs. So the first type is a very, is a canonical one in a way because it's the way minimizers were introduced in 2004 by Robert et al. It's the window minimizer. When, when you want to compute minimizers for a sequence, you actually consider windows of a certain fixed length of that sequence. And your minimizer is the smallest Elmer of each window. And sometimes the windows, since they overlap, can lead to um, having the same minimizer shared by two windows. So in a way, this is a local choice because um, depending on the sequence content of a window, the minimizer will, will be computed according to some context. And the other way to actually compute minimizers is what we call universe. And it bears similarities with min hash because in, in that formalism, you actually have a global set of Elmers that you decide are going to be your minimizers. And every time you encounter them in a sequence, they will be considered as minimizers, regardless of any windowing scheme. There is no windowing scheme in the universe minimizers. So assuming you have a fixed set of Elmers that you decide are minimizers, to compute minimizers of a sequence, you just scan the sequence from left to right. And each time you see the Elmer, you select it. So, sorry. But call at the same time, or probably this is not somebody asking me to fix something about my talk. Um, so also you might have seen on Twitter that there has been some extensive discussion on how to call those universe minimizers because they have already been introduced by other authors in calling them different names. So uh, scaled min hash in as a way to define the same object as universe minimizers. And also they bear similarities with um, asynchronous. And from now on in our minimizer space, the brain graphs, we will use universe minimizers, although window minimizers could also be used and we try them and it's also possible to use them. And before introducing what minimizer space the Bruin graphs are, I would like to give some behind the scenes on how we actually came up with this idea. So the idea comes from three different assembly algorithms which were released in the last two years. The first one is Shasta, which has many good ideas, but one of those ideas is to consider that each read is actually, can actually be seen as a list of minimizers. However, they didn't consider the brain graphs in Shasta. In another assembler, Peregrine, they indexed pairs of minimizers. However, they did not index more than pairs, so for instance, triplets or quadruplets. And in WTDBG2, they considered the brain graphs instead of representing k-mers on the ACTG alphabet, they consider an extended alphabet where um, bases are zoomed out in a way and uh, each character consists of uh, 256 mer. But they didn't consider minimizers in WTDBG2. So if you are aware of these three assemblers and, their, and the ideas I talked about, then it's possible with some thinking to try to unify um, those, those, those three ideas and come up with minimizer space between that. So our approach is to consider that minimizers are tokens of the alphabet. 
instead of letters A, C, T, G. Because in the classical alphabet of DNA, you have three letters. And sometimes the letter N is used for undetermined. However, this is not so common in the brain graph. So we will stick to only four letters. And the camera with K equal three, for instance, is AGT. In minimizer space analysis, we consider the minimizer alphabet, sigma to the power of L, where L is a constant. It's um, the alphabet of all, well, all words of length N. And actually, this is not an equal sign because we will use a subset of all words of length L, which will be all minimizers of length. Uh, uh, recall that we are using universe minimizers. So it's possible to enumerate them, minimizer one, minimizer two, and so on. So for instance, when L is equal to two, your first minimizer might be AA, second one might be AC, and, and three AG, and, and so on. That's M4. And then a KMR is no longer AGT, for instance, but it can be M1, M3, M2. And we call this in order to disambiguate a KMR. So it's a camera over minimizer letters. So once you do this slight uh, shift in, in framing, it's pretty much straightforward to define what a minimizer space the point graph because you can, again, start from reference genome or also a collection of reference genomes. Please disregard the reads because this is not the setting in this talk. And then you can consider minimizers that occur within the genomes. And and the sequence of those minimizers, for instance, here the sequence is M2, M3, M2, M4, M2, and then define k minimizers over that sequence of minimizers by just taking um, k minimizers over the minimizer alphabet. And here you can extract three k minimizers, which are going to be the nodes of your minimizer space, the green graph. So the first one is the node M2, M3, M2, second one is M3, M2, M4, and there is an edge between those two nodes because the M3, M2 portion is exact, exactly a, a K minus one overlap. And here it's K minus one is equal to two. So to recall, minimizer space De Bruyne graph is a classical De Bruyne graph, except that it is on the minimizer alphabet. Nodes are K minimums and edges are follow the same definition as De Bruyne graph. So this is tangential to this talk, but I just mentioned that we start by applying this formalism to whole genome de novo assembly of hi-fi um, reads. And here it's the top part of this slide shows the pipeline and the bottom part shows, shows some results. I will not go too long on this slide, but I will just mention that the pipeline does pretty much what you expect. So it starts from reads, converts all the reads to minimize the space, construct the MDBG, Simplify using the same techniques as classical De Bruyne graph assemblers. And then at this point, we have context, but in minimizer space. So we need to convert them into base space again by converting each k-minima to its original sequence. And finally, output context in base space. And this tool enabled us to perform a relatively high quality whole genome assembly from high fi reads at a much faster and more memory efficient way than existing assemblers. So to give an idea, we were able to assemble a human genome in, I think it was eight threads, in 10 minutes in, in 10 gigabytes of memory with um, not the highest NG50 values, but pretty pretty high already for, for the state of the art. But what I would like to talk about today with the remaining of this talk is how we actually performed pan-genome graph construction over a collection of 661,000 bacterial genomes. And the data comes from uh, Blackwell et al. 2001, which is from the Mixbal lab. They assembled pretty much all the bacterial samples you can find on ENA, and they released this very nicely curated uh, collection of those, of those assemblies. And I'm displaying here how big it is, if you store it on your cluster, it's a little bit less than three terabytes of space uncompressed. And for convenience, I uh, co compressed it in LZ4, which reduce, reduce the size by around two X, but enable to well, read decompress faster because you actually read less data from disk and decompression is extremely fast. So taking this collection, we gave it as input to Rust MDBG, which is our implementation 
of the MDBG. And I think Barish will talk more about the details of his implementation in Rust in his talk. And we set some parameters, which is K, the k-linear k -linear length, L being the minimizer size. And density is essentially how we sample the minimizer space, saying that we expect that we will find a minimizer roughly one every thousand positions. Here we open 0, 0, 001. And we decide to not filter any k-minimizers based on abundance, and we give the collection of assemblies as input. So what this does is it spits out a big graph in GFA format. And I was unable to actually display the entire graph because it has, um, I think, in the order of a million of nodes. So what I was able to do was to separate the graph by connected components. And thankfully, there were no big connected components, but instead the largest five connected components are shown here. And there is 700 more connected components which are not shown in this graph. It was possible to then annotate each node of these connected components by just remembering which genomes were the k-minimers seen, and then it was able to count how many taxons were present in each connected component and what were the dominant species. And often the number of taxons here was well, more than one, but those taxons were related to the species here. So there was no big surprises. And for instance, this component here is pretty much all salmonella. And then of course, when if your genomes are circular, you will get some circular components, but if the genomes are linear, the components would be not, not cyclic. And what you see on those components are variations between um, highly similar genomes, and well, and sometimes you've got, it's, I mean, it's difficult pretty much to draw general conclusions about each of those components, but I think they nicely reflect the diversity of similar genomes. And I use the term similar genomes because sometimes the same species is actually divided in multiple connected components. For instance, we don't see E. coli, although it is highly represented in this collection, we don't see E. coli in this, in this graph because it is split into multiple connected components because the genome from the same species actually are um, sufficiently different that k-minimers don't connect. So anyway, I could, I could take more questions about this, but for now, this is what it looks like. And then we actually applied this big MDBG to try to perform something useful on it. So we downloaded a collection of antimicrobial resistance, AMR genes, a, a, a bit more than a thousand of them, and we converted all of these genes into, um, into k-minimers, so in, in minimizer space. So then each gene is a, is a box of k-minimers. And then we queried for the presence of each k-minimer in the large graph of the collection. And we said that the gene was found if two thirds of these k-minimers were found in the collection. And so we found essentially something um, potentially expected is that when the genes from this collection were very similar to the genomes, I mean, the genes from the AMR collections were very similar to the genes present in the genomes from the collection, but it is a blue bar here, we were able to retrieve them. But as soon as the divergence was more than 1%, or even between 0, 2% and 1%, then querying k minimers led to uh, our, an inability to retrieve the presence of those genes in the collection. So this leads us to conclude that using k minimer analysis with this particular set of parameters is well suited for performing sequence queries up to around um, less than a percent sequence identity. And if you're wondering how we got this percentage of identities, we actually confirmed the presence of those genes in the bacterial collection using Minimap2. It was much longer to run, but it's, it's still run. I see I have a minute left, so I will just give you some quick behind the scenes. Oh, but I understand there's also 10 minutes of questions. So actually, I will take my time on this slide because it's potentially the most important for, for the hacking crowds. <laughs> 
Uh, and just a quick note, Barsh is not uh, is not able to speak today, so um, unfortunately, we won't get an additional update about that. Oh, oh, that's a shame. But well, thanks for telling me. So I guess I'm sorry. I should have mentioned before you're talking. Go ahead though, and, and go in, go into detail if you need. All right. So I'll, I'll try to give some details then. So. So what I believe Barish would have been able to talk about is the architecture of the Rust and DBG software. So in, in a nutshell, we are we have implemented MDBG in, in Rust, and um, it's not the most beautiful Rust because both him and I are um, beginners in that language, and we pretty much used out-of-the-box components from the language, so a pretty classical hash table for storing k-minimals. Um, we also used external components such as GFA tools for performing simplification on the graph. So it's not in the Rust software, but as an outside uh, C component. And what else could I have to say about this one? So it's, it's pretty much a k-minimal enumeration and indexing software that outputs a minimizer space to bring up. And then for performing genome assembly, we actually provide a set of scripts, which is outside of the software. And for performing pan-genome construction, we also provide a set of scripts, which is available here in, in the link. And in particular, I will just say some highlights about this experiment. So perhaps what is surprising is that the k search, we didn't do anything fancy. We, construct, we constructed the graph. And when we search for k on the disk file of the graph using grep, which took less than, I believe, something like 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, that's, that was pretty fast for performing queries across all of the AMR collection. But it can be, of course, further optimized if we had loaded all of these k-minimals in memory. Um, we stored those k-minimals in, in disk. By storing a k-minimal, I mean actually storing a list of uh, integers. And each integer is, is a representation of a minimizer. So if you have a k-minimal of length 10, you can imagine it as a vector of 10 integers. And we stored all of those k-minimals, which are the nodes of our graph using LZ4 on disk for fast decompression and then fast grep. If you're wondering how big uh, such a big pan-genome graph is, then when we store it on disk without any sequences, it takes around um, two to 20 gigs of space. And the reason for this wiggle room is because we experimented with multiple resolutions. Actually, what I mean by that is multiple density parameters. And I think this is the lowest density we used, and that's the one that takes two gigs of space. And then the resolution is essentially the length of the sequence that is covered by a k minimal. And it's 10 KB here because if you have a density of one over a thousand and k equal to 10, but each k covers roughly 10 kb of, of sequences in base space and 10 minimizers and minimizer space. So what this means is that essentially events which are shorter than 10 kb, KB would be less visible at, at the minimizer space representation, but any variation longer than 10 kb in genomes are likely to be more apparent in as graph motifs. So of course, these graphs do not reflect any SNPs or small indels due to the very low density in minimizer space representation that was by design. I'll mention some potential hacking directions that are not implemented yet. So it's still not trivial to separate any GFA by connected components. Uh, constructing succinct colored MDBG is an open problem that we didn't try to tackle because the implementation was sufficiently reasonably performant already, but making it more succinct would be, of course, of interest. Uh, computing k indexes would also be interesting. Essentially, the minimize the space counterpart of classical k indices, like Bloom filters or, or BOSS. And finally, visualization of those big graphs is, is still a big challenge, in my opinion. I'll conclude by mentioning that we, today I presented how MDBG could be applied not only to genome assembly, but pan-genome graph construction. 
So we could efficiently, in tens of gigs of disk space, represent a large material genome collection, which I believe is also the largest to date, at a resolution that is in between 10 and 100 kbp. Some further potential hacking directions are, is it possible to actually construct higher resolution NDBG? So for instance, one kbp can be understand. Is it possible to construct NDBG for eukaryotes? I believe it is, but we haven't performed this yet. And finally, there is this is more general, but I think it could be of interest because now that we have those large graphs, this opens up large directions for analysis, such as performing automated differential analysis on colored graphs. By colored, I mean where you can associate each node to a collection of genomes and perform large structural variant calling on colored graphs, which I believe might also be the topic of a talk later today. So that was my last slide. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ryan, for the lovely talk. There are a few questions uh, that I've pulled through from the chat. So far there might be another one coming right now. Um, so Njagi asks two questions. He says, first, uh, does the method assume that adjacent windows are more likely to share a minimizer? Um, it's a little bit unclear. I'm not sure if you want to try to tackle that. Okay, I could. Um, so, just, yeah. so first of all, we don't use any windows in universe minimizers, but it's also possible to tune the code of first NDBG to actually use window minimizers. And in that case, it's very likely that adjacent windows will share the same minimizer by design of minimizer schemes if you take lexicographically smaller elements inside a window. That makes sense. Okay, then the, the question, um, then is his question also is kind of a follow-up that the length part was not clear to him and he asked if they're all the same length. And I, I guess that the answer is yes, but maybe you want to elaborate on that. And maybe a follow-up is, can there be different lengths? Oh, so you're asking about the length of Elmer's or K-minus? Yeah, the, um, the length, I, uh, maybe you could talk about both, actually, the length of the minimizers and the, and the, and the K-minimers. Okay, so, so in minimizer space analysis, so we use minimizers of the same length, and it's typically 10, 12 base pairs for a minimizer. We have experimented by changing the side, and in my opinion, it doesn't change much in the application we considered. But of course, if you have unreasonable minimizer sizes, such as two, three, or even 20, 30, you would expect to quite change it a lot. But we, I mean, basically the short version is we are not able to squeeze better performance by tuning minimizer size in our applications. Yet it might be possible in other applications. And finally, for the length of K-minimers, by design of the brain graphs, they are always fixed to, to K. However, the span in base space of a k-minimer varies greatly because a k-minimer represents, implicitly represents a base space sequence. And that length depends on the space between uh, adjacent minimizers. Well, it varies greatly, but it's often, I think it follows a distribution that probably centered around uh, a value close to what I referred to as a resolution. There'll be Poisson distribution, maybe. I, it's possible, but I haven't worked out the math here. Okay, so Alex Leonard, uh, he asks, uh, is the lower N50 due to limitations of minimizer space, or do you think a more involved algorithm, probably at the cost of time, could reach base space assemblers um, in N50? Yeah. I was but, referring to this slide, yeah. That's, that's a great question, and I wish I had the answer here, and I'm, I suspect it is a combination of both because we know that in some regions it's hard to find universe minimizers for instance if they are low complexity and we by luck we didn't sample a minimizer there um that, that might happen in centromeres for instance and for sure we used very rudimentary graph simplification techniques that we didn't try to optimize so i'm pretty sure if we actually put the work here we could try to reach higher ng 50 Sorry. Yeah, then there's, um, okay, I, I just had a note. I wanted to mention that um, we, we actually have a connected component extraction algorithm in the logic toolkit. It's based on the union find algorithm driven over edges in the graph. 
you do that, then you can collect components pretty efficiently. That can be run in parallel as well. Uh, but that's a follow up, I guess, for you. Uh, yeah. Then Adonis has a question. He asks, is there any fixed or approximated relationship between the total length set and time to generate a pan genome? How would it be affected by, uh, how would the gene, I guess the assembly size be affected by applying the minimizers approach? Any fixed approach? Is it basically asking about the relationship between your parameters and the size of the graph that you, that you get? Oh. Uh, so, okay, first of all, thanks for the pointer on GFA connected component splitting. That's, that's great. Um, and then the, so the relation between construction time and parameters. Um, well, it's, um, I think in the paper, we report the construction time, but for just for one set of parameters in the pan genome experiment, but we actually experimented with two different densities, this one and one which is a hundred times, uh, a 10 times bigger. And I, I would be hard pressed to, to answer this in details, but I, of course this depends on the number of k minors that you get at the end of the first pass over your reads, because then afterwards we run a simple graph construction um, algorithm based on just testing all possible neighbors of the k minors to get to your edges. Nothing fancy here. And that would still dominate the uh, running time of the graph construction. So we do came in no counting in a very naive way. And this is pretty much depending on the time of the length of the input. Um, and of course, your density of, of minimizers, of the minimizer scheme you use. Um, but all of these parameters would have an influence on on construction time, of course, because if you don't sample any minimizer, then it's just the time of reading your input sequences and your graph will be pretty, pretty small. Okay, I think, I think it's all the time we have for questions, Ryan. Thank you for the talk, a really fascinating topic and exciting to see how we'll apply this in, in future pangenomic techniques. So, Thanks so much. To, to hear more.